This right here is the KSO Show, your home for K-State coverage. Stay current on what's happening in the wildcat world of sports. By the end, you might want to tell your friends about us. Or not. But hey, you should. Let's get it. Welcome to another edition of the KSO Show. This one being recorded from Stillwater, Oklahoma at an Airbnb that I think is... Uh, it's a roof over our heads, so I'll say that for us. Matt Hall with Derek Young. John Kurtz from K-Man. We were happy to be on his show yesterday. Weren't expecting to do a show this morning, but of course the news last night. Uh, I think, you know, I'm not getting into the whole who broke it. Pete Thamel broke it, you know, but I think maybe John Kurtz was the first one sitting in this room to really have true knowledge of it and talk about it. So we're going to talk about the Blake Siler situation, going to West Virginia to become their linebackers coach. While we're here, we're going to spend some time getting you ready for K-State Oklahoma State tonight at 5 o'clock, literally across the street from us. So Kurtz... I, I just want to start with you. I've liked some of your takes on, on Twitter. Not all of them, you know, of course. But I've liked some of your takes on Twitter. But it's particularly about, you know, this Blake Siler situation. I just want you to talk through maybe your thought process or when you first heard about it to what you think about the situation right now. And just, just share some some insight. Yeah, well, it's crazy because when I when I first heard about it, uh, get a call and it just seemed really out of the blue and was like, wow, this is pretty shocking. Um, that, I, I think, is what's which changed the most because you start as more information comes to light. And certainly we've talked to a lot of people. Um, you get a better understanding of the whole situation and what's going on. And I mean, there are some obvious things that everybody will point to that I do think play some factor here. I mean, Blake Seiler last year was the defensive coordinator at K-State. New staff comes. He's not named the defensive coordinator right away. Then one leaves another chance potentially to hire him. And I don't know. I mean, that's one area where I'll say there may have already been a discussion where Blake Seidler knew that that wasn't going to happen even if somebody did leave but either way two new defensive coordinators have come in he's not even coaching linebackers anymore he's coaching defensive ends uh, and took a $140,000 pay cut to stay on there I'll be very interested to see what the money is at West Virginia but there are a lot of reasons here that would lead you to believe okay this actually does make some sense I think what really is a bummer about it is, one, he's a K-State guy. I mean, we all think very highly of him, that he is uh, somebody that's no really doubt. sharp, has a great career in uh, in football coming up. And on top of that, it's the timing right by signing day. You don't love that. And you're going to a place in conference. And I know K-State has to be a little bit nervous about this just because Neil Brown is somebody that K-State could have had as the head coach. They went with Chris Kleiman instead, and now – one of your young, bright minds is going to that school. So it's just going to further enforce the competition, so to speak, between West Virginia and K-State and see who does better there. So Did, did you catch lo- Kelsey's tweet on the no-compete thing? Did you see no. that already? Yeah, I mean, so it's, it, it, in line with what you're saying, it's to your point. I saw a tweet from Kelsey Robinette. I didn't read the whole story, but he said something about, and maybe Derek saw it, but that more or less all of the hires made uh, – the new hires outside of Klein and Siler believe have some sort of no compete clause in their contract, so they can't go do that. But apparently Blake Siler didn't, so it's wow. interesting because okay. you don't want a guy to go to a league rival like you said, and they're worried about yeah. it like you like you were. Maybe uh, maybe that's something I, I would imagine. This is just pure speculation upon just hearing that, but they probably knew. Okay, Blake Siler is a guy that is. I assume it is. This is from his new contract, right? That he just signed with the new staff. I believe so. Like, okay. I just read Kellis's tweet. I haven't read your story, sir. So, but. so if that's the case, it may be, okay, we know Blake Seiler is a bright mind that's going to attract some attention. We know that we're asking him to move down from defensive coordinator to a position coach job. We know that we're asking him to take less money. That may have been something to help sweeten the pot and keep sure. him there initially is to not make him sign some, quarter, uh, some kind of uh, non-compete. I would imagine that's something that would have been possible. Absolutely. Derek, you, you too um, have a, a lot of great insight on this from as good a sources as most guys can find. Um, somebody up here, I believe it was Hound Dog, who is Purple Rain on the board, asks if you're the hardest working man in, in America. I mean, it's possible. Yeah. Thank you. It's not him. I mean, I, w- I don't know. Hard. I mean, Mason's, Mason got up pretty early to do his show today. But, but Derek, you know, similar to John, you know, same kind of question. Just what, what have you learned about this that you're comfortable sharing in the last 12 to 20 hours, whatever it is? And your thoughts in general on this surprising outcome? I think first we'd be remiss to say not only did Blake Seiler take a demotion in title and a demotion in pay, but I, I believe he's also was getting paid less than Joe Klanderman, than less yes. than Van Malone. So I think he was also the third or fourth highest 
paid uh, coach on the defensive staff, so I think that also played into it. Not only is he not the coordinator, he's probably not the number two guy, at least in pay, on the defensive staff. And I think that, you know, in terms of pride, could have had some kind of role. So I think that's probably one of the probably four or five factors that were involved. I think there is a family tie-in when it comes to his wife's side of the family that played a role. Uh, that portion of the country kind of lends itself to a family element for the Siler family. I also think that when it comes to uh, his goals, his his mission, he's, I think he still wants to be a defensive coordinator. That's what he aspires to be, maybe even a head coach someday. And I think he sees a better route to that point from as a linebacker coach as opposed to a defensive line coach, at least from folks that I've spoken to. And, and I think a lot of defensive coaches and head coaches would probably say the same thing. You look at the defensive coordinators, whether it be in the – you know, FBS, Power Five, or, or anything of that nature, uh, or even in the NFL. Like, I think I saw at least someone threw a number at me. I, don't, I can't verify if it's true one way or the other, but at least 90% of defensive coordinators did not become a defensive coordinator moving directly from coaching the defensive line. It's either linebacker or defensive back, and I think that's something that Blake Seiler took into account as well. So if I could – jump in here if that's all right I like how you turned it and I think <laughs> yeah it's like the like the slide in from Collins work. right um <laughs> I think in, in summation basically I think yes the obvious things are in play here like what DY said Blake Seiler of course want you know he's a driven guy that quit a job making uh, six figures as an engineer to go make no money coaching in football he's clearly yeah. a driven guy that wants to get beyond just being a position coach so the fact that it's, I think, a good career move from the standpoint of not being just a defensive ends coach, which is lower on the totem pole than being a linebackers coach, um, it, it's not the same. I know I've seen people arguing on the boards like, hey, it's the same thing. It's not. So it's right. It's it's a step up in terms of his responsibility and a better path to being a defensive coordinator. Uh, also, he may get more money. We'll see. Um, I don't know what the money's going to wind up being exactly there, but I would imagine it may be at least a little bit more money and I don't think he would have left for just any situation and that's where the family stuff comes into play this works out well for his wife Inga who yeah. is from Newcastle Pennsylvania which according to uh, Google Maps is 121 miles from Morgantown West Virginia close to her family it's close to the in-laws um, which you can imagine there's family things at play there that would really help out and he's also going to a situation where it's not like he doesn't know anybody here because the defensive coordinator there is is it Vic Koning or Koning? I would say Koning. I Vic, Vic Koning. Sounds um, cooler. Who, who was Anybody it? knows, tell us, Koning or Koning. Right, right. So in 2009, Koning was the defensive coordinator at K-State when Snyder first came back, and Blake Seiler was a quality control assistant, I believe, at that point, working under him. The point is, he worked under Koning way back when. So he's going to a situation where he knows the defensive coordinator. It works out well for his family. It's not just uprooting – uh, a family with a couple of young kids completely to somewhere unknown. Right. There's going to be a lot of help from his family there, and it will make his wife comfortable in that regard. So that's where the obvious factors merge with a situation that seemed appropriate for Blake Seiler here. That, I think, is why you've seen this happen and this move uh, occur. Derek, I, I want to ask you a question about what he just said, too, and about recruiting. We're seeing a lot of questions pop up. Uh, just right now on, on Kurtz's Twitter, on our board, a lot of questions about recruiting, so we're going to ask you that in a second. But I want to say, from what you know, would, would you – I don't want to put words in your mouth, but would you agree the family issue was a legitimate – I mean, it could be about money and promotion, all that kind of stuff, but wouldn't you agree the family issue is a real thing and part of the reason why this move happened? I would think that it's probably what put it over the top. Sure. I, th I think that, you know, there's an opportunity there, you know, to get on a better path to becoming a defensive coordinator, to, you know – you know, getting back and working with Vic Honing and, and, you know, be coaching the linebackers, which I think he likes probably likes to do a little bit more, all that, and, and a little bit more money. All that is probably was great for him and something that he would consider. I think that something that just probably like nudged it over the top and ultimately made him do that would probably be that it would make sense from a family standpoint. Right. Because if it didn't, I don't know if the other factors would have been enough. So I don't think it was the factor, but it might have been – what clinched it near the end. Absolutely makes sense. Like we talked about before we came on the air, these people's lives, Blake Seilers, whoever's, they're not that dissimilar than yours or ours. You know, you make decisions based on a variety of things. It's not usually just one thing. And and I'm, I think it's everything these guys, these smart guys, if I could say, uh, <laughs> talked about, you know, in my opinion. 
I, I do want to say this too because I think it's easy for some to freak out and draw conclusions to okay this is a real red flag for the the program right. as a whole the program at large you know with Chris Kleiman I don't think that's it at all I, I think if you if your criticism is Blake Seiler is important enough that he should not have been put as defensive ends coach to try and prevent something like this I, I do think that's probably sure. a discussion that we can have depending on what happens with Blake Seiler on down the road but clearly Chris Kleiman valued the, the guys that he was going to bring in and put in, in those situations. Um, and, you know, when first approaching Blake Seiler about this, I would think he had to know in the back of his mind, well, it's a definite possibility. Blake Seiler would just say, ah, I think I'm going to go evaluate my options and, and not take that in the first place. So basically I'm saying Chris Kleiman comes in knowing and thinking he can put together a great defensive staff. This is going to sound harsh with or without Blake Seiler. Sure. It's no statement on Blake Seiler. It's just, that's the way a new coach is going to think when he comes in. So th- this is not some systemic Blake Seiler hated Chris Kleiman. In fact, I think all of us would echo that we've heard the complete opposite, that they really had Correct. a very good relationship yeah. and meshed very well. Um, but th- this is kind of a business decision. You know, it doesn't have to be some deep-seated decision filled with hate and a bunch of jealousy. And I don't think it has to be all of that. But at the end of the day, it's a business decision for Blake Seiler. Uh, Clearly, Chris Kleiman has already shown the ability to hire a good defensive staff because right. two of his guys have left for an arguably better job at West Virginia and then a job in the NFL. So I think that speaks to the guys that have been brought in here on this staff so far. Don't try and draw any big-picture conclusions about systemic issues with the program because of this. That That is something I would like to – preach and put out yeah there. and I, I i want to i would do i do want to ask derek about recruiting here in a second but i i want to add a thought to that because i agree i think it's a thing i'm trying to watch my words here because blake seiler to us and then to k-state fans meant a lot because we we you know we know him we like him we think he did a good job last year uh we think he has a bright future all those things are true so but that's what a k-state fan sees him as right um a person in college wall in general would look at him and say, oh, that guy's a, a good, you know, a good defensive line coach or a good linebackers coach, which isn't a knock on him. But that's what K-State lost, you know, was what college football would see in general as a good coach, a good position coach, but a position coach. So to turn it into a, somebody said D.Y. is the goat. I think that mm-hmm. means the guy on a... Tear. Thro- tear, in, that'd be good. In NBA yeah. Jam. He is on, okay, fair enough. But I mean, it's the thing where it hurts us more it hurts k-state more because of who k-state sees him as when in general the college football world would look at this and say oh this is a problem a red flag of like you said a systemic issue yeah. i do want to say like i said we've got lots of questions i've seen it on kurtz's twitter i've seen it on ours about about recruiting Derek. we get into signing day what next wednesday is that the seventh i believe it is this upcoming Wednesday. so it's obviously very close a lot of questions about man does this hurt that it came out before signing day does how bad is the timing all that kind of stuff who does it lose so many questions. So I'm going to let you just kind of rant in general about Blake Seiler, this decision, and the impact on K-State's recruiting. Yeah, some of it Russia, we'll be able to that, dig yeah. into full-fledged is some of that stuff they want you know, to wait until after National Signing Day. But I do think that they're going to be able to hang on to do, uh, definitely at least one of the two that Blake Seiler had a, you know, a direct role in that isn't signed for at least for the 2019 class. And that's Steve at the back, Tyron Lewis of Louisiana, and then uh, linebacker commit. Gavin Potter of Oklahoma. Yeah. He, he's visiting Texas Tech this weekend. I will say that he was not blindsided by the information. He knew about uh, Blake Siler's decision to leave for West Virginia before it broke by Pete Thamel. So that wasn't like a blindsided type of thing. They did their homework and they and they approached him and, and delivered that message the appropriate way. So they won't lose him just for the way that they've handled it. I do think that it, it will be tough to hang on to him because – I understand that Blake Seiler was supposed to be the defensive end coach and Gavin Potter is the linebacker coach. But for the majority of Gavin Potter's recruitment, Blake Seiler was going to be his position coach because right. Seiler recruited the linebackers. He coached the linebackers. And even when, you know, Scotty Hazleton and Ted Monachino were on the staff, or Scotty Hazleton still on the staff, Blake, or yeah, Blake Seiler was still the lead recruiter. He's the one that's always had the best relationship with Potter, and that's not going to change. It's going to come down in the last three or four days when it's Potter as whether or not they, Scotty Hazelton can forge at least close to the type of relationship that Blake Seiler did. Absolutely. Somebody asked, where's Flando? Don't worry about it, okay? He's, he's somewhere running this thing. Um, Derek, you said a point that I thought, I thought was very interesting and very pertinent. 
and I don't want to put you in an uncomfortable spot, but it sounded like you said that Potter knew about this before it broke. Yep. So I think we get people freak out, ourselves included last night as we're all learning this kind of for the first time, you know, throughout the afternoon, early evening. I think, man, the timing is so bad. And this, if this breaks before the recruits know, it sounds like the recruits that needed to quote needed to know knew about this before it got out with Pete Thamel last night. Yeah, the two that would absolutely need to know. And I don't think people in the 20, the prospects in the 2020 class knew. I think they were kind of taken aback by surprise, but there's only so many you could tell. And obviously you make the priority to be the 2019 kids. And it was Tyron Lewis and Gavin Potter. And they both knew well ahead of time. I think they probably were told on Thursday, like more than 24 hours before this broke. So everything was done appropriately. So they won't, they won't lose the recruit because they mismanaged it. Right. You know, we're about probably to get into the Oklahoma State talk, of course, as we are here in Stillwater where the Wildcats will take on the Cowboys today at 5. But I do want to, from Kurtz, before we go on, um, get this from both you guys. We're moving to basketball and then maybe finish up by running through questions we have from the Twitter followers and the people on YouTube here. I, I was just going to – I'll let you finish. I was going to throw in the questions on Siler before we move on Let's to do basketball. Let's do that. If that's cool. Um, so, seriously, would anybody be surprised if Blake Siler is back in three to five years? Not really. I mean, no. I, th- I think that's a part of this. He gets a chance to go prove himself at uh, a Big 12 level school, certainly a peer kind of school to K-State. And I think it's very possible. Like Blake Seiler had the quote to all of us when we were initially asking him about staying on and said, hey, man, you cut me, I bleed purple. Like that yeah. guy, that guy is full of EMA. So I think it's, it's absolutely the kind of guy that would come back. And I don't think there are feelings hurt to the point where he wouldn't come back. So, no, I think – I think it's absolutely possible uh, that he would come back. Are you finally wearing a coat from yeah. Jmart? I imagine that that's oh, is for that me? that's for Matt. Oh uh, yeah. yeah, a little jacket. I mean, it's you know, I wouldn't say a coat, but I'm glad you noticed. Uh, do they just replace? Let's see. Do they just replace with another coach for just defensive ends? I mean, yeah. That's a good question. I mean, I guess you could add a second linebackers coach. Some teams do that. I think they. I guess that's true because you could have a defensive line. Yes, I'm sorry. I kind of stumbled through reading that reading that question, Spencer. Right? Yeah. So, uh, name. I mean, I don't know. Are you comfortable throwing out any names at this point? One that people have uh, you know said immediately as possibly a candidate, not like sources of any kind, but. You know, the ones that we've kind of jumped to conclusion on. A.J. Cooper, I think, mm-hmm. is the defensive line coach at Wyoming. Worked with Hazleton at Wyoming. Worked with Hazleton and Kleiman at North Dakota State. So that ma- that makes, uh, you know, a bit of sense. The name escapes me right now. And it was a Brand- Brandon Hall, I think, has actually been a linebackers coach at Troy in Arkansas State. Was at North Dakota State for some time. And he actually also coached at Broken Arrow High School before he got into the group of five. So it's an interesting, you know, uh, connection there. And you wonder about some of the old names, again, if they're going to stick with two D-line coaches. When I say old names, Buddha Williams from North Dakota State, Jamar Kane from Fresno State. I don't I don't know that it's going to be – I'd probably be surprised if it's either of those yeah. two. Mm-hmm. But if you're searching for names, you know, of guys, the two that Derek threw out. Um, but there is some versatility, right? They could go two D-line coaches. They could go two linebacker coaches, like you said, to give Hazleton some more room to just coordinate the defense. So I think it'll be interesting to see who they fill it with. Are you surprised the news came out before signing day a little bit? And I think in an ideal, perfect world, this would have waited until signing day. But, I mean, it's it's hard to keep these things under wraps. I, I, Pete Thamel, uh, a national guy like that tweeting it out, tells me that an agent was, was the leak there on that side of things. And I know from what we could gather, it sounded like West Virginia, even their side was trying to be very coy about it and not release it publicly either. So – you know, that, that's another thing here. This was just one person that I saw saying, well, this is, you know, uh, a blank move from Blake Seiler to, to announce it before signing day. That's, I think, out of control, out of Blake Seiler's control, the fact that it got released. And they were trying to do, based on everything we know, man, they were trying to do everything absolutely above board the right way with this situation. But it's it's 2019, and sometimes that happens. Yeah, go ahead. I could probably expand on that. And, and they were definitely planning for this to be, I guess, announced later, or at least broken later. But And once they realized that this was about to leak uh, at, at you know to any point, that they started to make uh, you know movements and, and started to process things and make decisions – based on that because they weren't going to tell certain people until you know much later and instead they started to make calls throughout yesterday letting people know what was going to happen we I, i'm not going to go all the way into it we got some weird information good information but like yesterday afternoon that suggested this could be happening but it didn't neither of us had it registered to us just right you yeah know? we were told <laughs> in kansas state 
linebacker coach that previously, but it was described as previously coached linebackers right. at Kent State, was probably going to take a West Virginia job. But I guess because of the language, and we just assumed Blake Siler staying no matter what, I assumed it was Mike Cox. But. Right. I, I read the language funny of it too. I think John Kurtz, if anybody you know really wanted to be in a race to break this thing, could have been could have been John Kurtz for sure. But you know, I think. Uh, Understood the right thing probably to do from the basis of all that was going on, but it was was interesting and surprising. But I think uh, I think K State will be okay, and I think we all hope Blake Siler will do well. Yeah, man, at West like Virginia. I absolutely wish Blake Siler the best. Like he's uh, he is one of the most impressive young coaches that I've certainly been around, and you can just you can tell that that guy is going to do big things in college football in his career. And I completely understand why he would go do this. I mean, if you guys want final words there on that on Blake Siler. I mean I just I wish the guy best of luck and I would hope that most of you all do the same I know it's tough for a K-State alum to see him go but I, I think you could understand if you just open your mind up a little bit why this happened and and still say hey this is one of our guys going and having success somewhere else and he may be back someday it's probably hard for him too I think it's well said a um, couple questions I saw before we move into more serious basketball talk are very some important things we were asked on yours Kurtz if we have OSU mugs, um, I mean, I kind of. They, they are. Technically, actually, if you really like, look at it, they. I guess they are. They're, Oklahoma they're, State um, School of Business. School of Business. Yep, so yeah. that's nice, I guess. Um, we apparently do have Oklahoma State mugs. We're not not pulling for the pokes, although this guy. Um, I'll, I'll probably pull for the just what was here in the Airbnb, man. Another man. question asked on ours from, uh, I think it's Black Ema on the site, Mr. Napier, asked what's in the mug. I mean, you poured it for me. He's asking about pregame, and is this just coffee? Is I, there Bailey's? I poured it. Kurt's made it. It's coffee. Uh-huh. Just coffee. regular coffee. Regular coffee, coffee, guys. Yeah. We're, we're all prof- drinking it straight, right? Yeah. So no, all straight. Yeah. Nope. We're all professionals here. <laughs> all straight. I can't. I can't show. It. Um, some basketball questions. They'll answer some of these hoops questions I've seen pop up in ours, and if you have any, we could try two sure. before general discussion. One I saw from Miles Dewey on YouTube asks us, "What's happening with Oklahoma State and its players leaving and getting kicked off? How many will suit up today?" It was probably two weeks ago at this point, three weeks ago, Oklahoma State had to kick three players off its team. They held walk-on tryouts. We had the ever-intelligent KSU fan on the KSO show Thursday night, and you had him on your show this week, too. Yeah. The point is, I think fan told us Oklahoma State's really only going to go about six deep. They have more guys who will be on the bench who are in uniform and can play, so I don't know that actual number. But they have six or seven guys. They maybe feel. I think they're down to playing. nine scholarship players. If it makes that sense. if that yeah, helps it out. Eight or nine, and a few of the guys that will be on a bench today probably were playing at the wreck a couple weeks ago. So my yeah, battery is about to die. Yeah. Find out if you could go grab. Yeah, I think it should be my room. Yeah, 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 yeah like yeah. right now, I guess would be the time for it. I'm so. trying, to, trying to keep the levels. So uh, my battery's about to die. My computer. I don't want you guys to lose this feed of us. There's. Multiple dozen people looking at this, and if, you don't, if, we, if we do lose it, head to John Kurtz's Twitter at JL Kurtz on what, Twitter. What's happening here? Your computer about to it's die. It's about to die. But oh, Flanders okay. is not a producer, just an audio. He's a producer and getting cords, and so we've got that coming back. Um, I think that was the biggest question I saw about the Oklahoma State basketball game today, other than us talking about it in general. I did see a note. I can't remember what it was on. It was on. Uh, here's a question to start with right here. Yeah. From John Kurtz's Twitter. What has happened in the last week of practice to make us believe Casey will play better than it did last Saturday? I think it's a totally fair question. I'm going to let you guys answer it after I throw my thoughts into it. Is when I read a question like that or hear a question like that, I think, what makes you think they're that team as opposed to the team that won five straight Big 12 games before that? would be my question. I, I don't know that anything has happened to make me think they're a way different team than last Saturday. But I don't know if last Saturday's team is who they always are. I, I'm more expected to be the team they were in Big 12 play, not who they were in out-of-conference. But throw the same question at Kurtz, then D.Y. We'll get him in some hoops talk. What would make you think K-State could be a different team than you saw last Saturday? I just think they've built up enough of a body of work with Dean Wade being back. Um, and, and this team has really evolved a couple of times. Now they've evolved into the team with a healthy Dean Wade. They've only lost one game. They've beaten a couple ranked teams with him. Um and we knew that this team was capable of having a night like that where their their shooting just really fails them and it snowballs and just a dead arena, not a very good environment. It's a random game in the SEC. I think there's enough logically to tell you that's a blip on the radar screen and an aberration. Um, and, and also, just the way that they've approached it. I've said it a couple times now, but basically it was on t- – I was making the joke like uh, on to Cincinnati from Bill Belichick was the – message that we were getting from everybody they didn't really want to talk too much about the AM game it was all about on to Oklahoma State it, it just suggests to me that the way the coaches view it is 
a lot of things happened that night. Dean Wade didn't have his legs. He's playing too many minutes right now. You know, some things all came together, and they're not ultimately thinking that is what this team is. So I, I can tell you, I think the team certainly believes that. I'm going to ask D.Y. a different question about K-State Hoops in a second. I saw a nice response that he wasn't trying to be negative. You know, he, in that question, he's just seen it before. Yeah. And we have, too. My pushback was not to be negative either. But you've also seen the positive before. You've also seen him win a lot of games. So I think it could go, it could go either way. Um, I'm going to ask Kurtz a question here in a second, but I'm going to go to D.Y. Um, you know, been a lot of games. You were in, you went down to College Station last week. You've seen a number of games in person. You watched them all on TV when you aren't able to be there. So very aware of this. He simply asks, I lost it. Logan WN on YouTube just asks, um, how much of K-State struggles in basketball are mental? What, in your opinion, how much of it's mental? I think that probably a lot of it is mental, and that's more because I think mentally Kansas State has to probably show up a little bit more than the typical team just because yeah. they're not going to be superior, superiorly athletic or talented to their opponent most times in the Big 12. Uh, I think it's probably even in a few cases, at least half of them, but they're not going to be like KU or, or even uh, – you know, I guess West Virginia a few times over the past few years, maybe even Texas Tech last year. They're not one of those teams where they just are that superiorly yeah. talented and athletic to their opponent. So if they don't work as play as hard or or not as engaged as as the other as the other teams, uh, then they're they're more liable to lose a game like that because they they have to be perfect mentally probably to win. Whereas, you know, other teams in the league might have a less or, or more of a margin for error. Kansas State just can't sleepwalk and win like someone like KU can. That's a different perspective than I've heard. That's actually really interesting to me, and I think makes I think makes a lot of sense. Kurt's on YouTube. Andre Napier, I believe he's Black Ema on the, our site here at KSO, simply asks, how long do you think it will take for Dean Wade to get his legs back? Yeah, I mean, it was the first time I had heard Bruce Weber mention something because, I mean, he came back and, like, I'd have to go look at the minutes specifically. I don't think they were pushing was, him to the point where it was 38, 39 minutes, which is where it could be 20, and probably it was would be. 22 at Iowa State. Okay. Then I think it jumped up into the low 30s. Right. I think he hit 30 yeah. really about the second game that he was coming back against Oklahoma uh, and seemed to be fine. Like, it just seemed like Dean Wade was Dean Wade. And I was honestly a little bit surprised because he only had one day of practice in a month. And it's just hard to stay in basketball shape like that. So I think it may have just been a cumulative effect where that's starting to catch back up with him. But, I mean, I think – I don't know that there's a way you could specifically quantify this is when they will totally be back. But I, I think it's all still moving in the right direction. And maybe yeah. it changes a little bit how they manage some of the minutes in, in this game, especially in the first half, if they can get them a little bit more of a break. I wouldn't worry about it too terribly much until we see another bad shooting performance from Dean Wade. Missing six straight shots in the second half was crazy, and you just never see that. And I think that's where you saw uh, some of the issues with not having, quote-unquote, your legs under him uh, start to crop up there. So if we see another game like that, I'll start to become more concerned. But for right now, um, I'm not terribly worried about that being a long-term issue. It's even been a week since that. And, yeah. And I know this sounds crazy, but these guys are really good athletes, and yeah. they can get back into shape fairly quickly. Maybe I'm putting too much on them, but I don't think it'll be too much beyond today to even see him get close to 100% in terms of his legs. And, and I'll just come out and say it. Maybe I shouldn't. I think this could be an example. We, were, You know, as, as Kurtz did a good job of playing some clips from Chris Lowry a couple Wednesdays ago in the game, Bruce Weber will say some things that he knows are a little silly and maybe not even totally accurate to take the focus off certain things. So when he knows Dean Wade misses six shots in a row in the second half and airballs a wide-open 12-footer, maybe instead of making the conversation about Dean Wade missing a bunch of shots, it's like, ah, oh, the guy's coming back from, you know, from his, his legs aren't back. But, I mean, it you is know, probably fair. Because, I think it's I mean, both. When, right. when have we ever seen Dean Wade right. shoot right. like that? It just The problem is he doesn't shoot enough, but we've never really seen him shoot like that. Oh, I totally agree. So it, yeah. it, it does make sense. I think there's probably, maybe it's exaggerated a little bit right. by Bruce, but there has to be a morsel of truth in there somewhere I, with right. that. I don't think it's false. I guess my reason to saying this is I'm with Derek. I don't think it's going to be a factor going forward. I think it probably was a bit of a factor, you know, at A&M, but probably not a major one. And then a week later, it's probably going to be good. I thought I saw another question for I thought, Kurt, but yeah, I lost it. I think it was a factor. I just think a and probably the last time it is a factor. Um, a couple fun ones. Did Derek borrow an orange? We're going to talk about this. Derek, show him the shirt you're wearing. Let's explain this. Because I had the same concern. Derek is John. wearing an orange shirt um, for this. And then I said, dude, orange shirt. It's a Johnny Manziel shirt. If you guys don't know, KSO is adopted NFL team. Uh, you maybe even throw a Kurt. Can we throw you on this? Are you yeah, a, oh, yeah, I love the Browns. Yeah, Browns yeah. fans. Browns fans. Now, now Johnny Manziel didn't work out with the Browns, as you guys might know. But, it's fun. But <laughs> it's the only Browns merchandise he has right now, so he's going to wear it. That's why 
Another question uh, somebody asked on Kurtz's Twitter about when this will be available in pod form. We're going to have it up. 10 minutes as soon as we stop recording this thing. You know, it's 10.30 right now. Probably got five, two more minutes. Oklahoma State Talk, we'll have it right on the site. You can hear what John Kurtz, Derek Young said about recruiting with Blake Seiler. Any other questions you have? Uh, let's talk about the Pokes a little bit. Another question here from Andre Napier, Black Ema. Who's the scariest player for Oklahoma State? Is it McGriff? To me, it is. Yeah. It funny, we did a draft yesterday. We argued about in the car. It was a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> I think he's the most scary player. I'm not as a joke. I do think Lindy Waters is a guy who I might, can. I might argue against that. He might argue Lindy Waters because if you're looking at the guys who are from three, is Lindy Waters the guy who concerns you most for Oklahoma State? Kirk? Well, the only reason I say that, so Cameron McGriff is the best player all around that Oklahoma State has, and I wouldn't argue that Lindy Waters is a better player. But the thing that Lindy Waters has is he's like, it's close to 45% from three. Yeah. I mean, the guy's a ridiculous three-point shooter. And when you're a team like Oklahoma State right now, I know a KSU fan was talking somewhat about this. Their strategy can kind of become now, hey, we're going to go bomb a bunch of threes because the way we're going to be able to beat people with only six real rotation players now is just if we happen to catch fire from right. three uh, because they're liable to wear down down the stretch. Pounding it inside is not really going to be all that effective. So – I think the most dangerous thing about Oklahoma State is that they just have this carefree attitude of let's go bomb some threes, and Lindy Waters is the guy that would be the catalyst, you would think, in that. So that's, to Everyone's me, why he bombing would, threes off camera, would, right? Yeah. <laughs> that that's, I that about, to me, is why I would be more worried about can it. Can we talk about Cameron Lard? Because that would be great. Oh, uh, we go to Cameron Lard. Here's the fascinating thing, guys. Um, how much zone do you think we see today? Uh, probably a lot. We're going to cover that because it's a good question. I just want to make a funny note. We, we did this draft yesterday in the car because we like we make these rides. We make this funny drafts in our head. We did it all Big 12. We had four teams. The point I was going to make that just came to me is the four teams. We had me and Flando picking a team. Mason had a team. Uh, D.Y. and Chris Nelson had a team. And Kurtz had a team. And those four teams, 20 Big 12 players, we had two Oklahoma State players and only one Kansas player drafted. We sure did. How about that? that Isn't is that fascinating? I like, considered LeGerald Vick instead of so Lindy Waters. So did we. We considered that Vic, makes you we feel considered any Vic multiple times if you're a candidate. We did not. But we talked about, you know, like, why is the dip, why is the, um, you know, why is the level, or why is Kansas different? We have that conversation all the time. We're not going to do it again. We're not, this is not a hot talk for us again. But the, why it's different is we just picked 20 players when we took one from Kansas, two from Oklahoma State, three or four from K State, you know, three from. Anyway, a question about, you know, Derek, I'm going to ask you this too. Uh, I, I, missed, I missed who asked it. I'm sorry about that, but from John Kurtz's Twitter. We're asked this question to get on to score predictions. How much zone, he asked, how much zone do you think we see today from Oklahoma State? And then two, he made a comment that I tend to agree with. He thought K-State played well against his own last week, just missed open shots. So one, do you think we see a lot of zone today from the Cowboys across the street here at Gallagher-Iba? And two, how can K-State play against that zone? Yeah, I think even the teams that don't play zone will play a lot of zone against K-State. I mean, you saw that from Texas A&M. They barely played any zone, and, and it showed. Right. Their, their zone defense was not very good. It right. looked like they didn't. K-State got the open shots they wanted. They just didn't hit them, so I would agree. I think that they were fine against the zone, especially it wasn't a very good zone from A&M. The problem, and I understand the complaint that a lot of people have, they wish they could get more shots closer to the basket against the zone, and I do understand that argument, but you have to know your personnel. And Kansas State scoring close to the basket with their fives, so to speak, do you really want a lot of shot attempts from the right. fives on the Kansas State roster? I know I would and, and right, and there's different kind of zones as everybody's watching this and watching basketball knows. And the one that AM was playing, you know, yeah, two, three, like everybody else, but they were, you know, packed in. They were going to let K State take wide open 20 footers and even 18 footers. Do you still attack? Of course you do. But I mean, there's, there, it's not, it's not a one, you know, what is a blanket, one thing fits all. You can't just attack this every zone the same, particularly because the zone can guard a part of the floor and take it away. They're surprised we didn't take, you know, Dotson from KU. They like him. He was a big guy we could have picked too, of course. We're going to wrap this up. We've been on for a little over 30 minutes here on the KSO Show. I forgot our sponsors. I apologize. Tallgrass Tap House back home in Manhattan. Could have hit that up before we left. We didn't. Thursday we did. That's good. By the way, if you go there, they've been doing this for me, and I appreciate them for it. Get a oh. Boulevard Wheat. What if we get it called? Some pineapple juice, and it's it's not a Nancy. It's a curtsy. Just if, ask them for the curtsy. What if the curtsy could show up on their menu? I mean that like that's I would have arrived like that, that would be that it. is what there's I there's nothing want. left for you to accomplish in yeah. this world if that yeah. happens that's that would be a career Correct. accomplishment number one I saw one fun question above asking for dinner plans in Stillwater Nelson where did we go last night what was that place called the garage the garage oh they have great chicken fajita tacos very good place we had a the good burgers. we had a good time there it was the a burgers. good time there's a barbecue place Nelson bad Brad's barbecue. bad Brad's barbecue I believe we might go there today it's only 10:35 right now we've got to go to lunch somewhere so that's it let's get through this let's pick K State 
Oklahoma State and get off of here and you guys can listen to this. If you're catching the end of it, it will be available in podcast form by 11 o'clock, probably at worst. Start with Derek Young. What's going to happen today? K-State, Oklahoma State, what do you think is going to happen? Give us a result. Talk us through it. Come on, Johnny. I think KSU fan probably said it best on the uh, podcast Thursday night, and he said that it's just going to be kind of like the cumulative effect. Oklahoma State, they're trying to kind of getting into the meat of the season where they don't have a lot of players available to, you know, so to speak. They don't have a lot of depth. There's a lot of minutes for some of those players, and now you're getting to the kind of the meat, the meat and bones of their season. And at the same time, Kansas State comes in, you know, probably a little bit more hungrier for a win, I would think, because of the implications of what their season could provide. And then I just see them wearing them down. It's probably still going to be close at halftime, and, and all of you are going to be furious that it's close <laughs> at halftime. But I think they separate and win by double digits in the second half on the road. Curtsy. Very, very similar thoughts. I mean, I, I think I said the other day, like 73 59. I, I think it'll be a pretty back and forth game, but K State can wear down Oklahoma State a little bit and uh, not be too, not have to sweat it out too much there at the end. So I, I would think somewhere around there for K State. I'm with these guys. I like K State 67 58. I don't have anything smarter to add than John Kurtz or Derek Young did. We're excited to bring you this today from Stolar. We'll have lots of coverage. I'm sure John Kurtz will. All over Twitter, Powercat Game Day video, I'm sure. Like all yeah, that, all yeah. Stuff. so just check where JL Kurtz, Powercat Game Day. Yep, we will have uh, some reaction from Bruce Weber and players after the game. Similar-ish from us, but come to our side and take it from there instead. I appreciate John Kurtz, uh, Derek Young, all his work. You'll see a ton from him in the coming days in recruiting and probably from today's game, even Grant Flanders for his work behind the scenes. We're going to do this more in the future, guys. We'll have a better-looking set, studio, lighting, whatever you want to call it. Um, appreciate the, those of you.